I advise her, I also teach self-help English and good writing, so I know a lot of your faces. Um, so you guys are in for a real, a real treat today. I'm not going to introduce the guest speaker because I'm going to do that to Blake. Um, but I would ask you, uh, as usual, I'm just going to ask you to just put away your, your earbuds. In fact, I see very few earbuds out there on our YouTube, which I really appreciate. Uh, and put your phones away. Um, on some of the panels, the students have been asking you to get out of the pair deck, but I don't think we do that. I guess we can do that today. Um, so if you can have those things away, that would be great. Uh, and I hope that you enjoy the presentation today. Hello, everyone. So I'd like to thank you all for coming to Alley and helping support the GSTA and all we do. And I just want to take a minute and just say that the GSTA has worked so hard in making Alley Week possible for all of you. Um, so we have a very special guest speaker with us today. Um, Gia is the program director of Equality Maine. Um, I'm going to let her talk a little bit more about Equality Maine, but it's a very amazing organization. Um, I met Gia a few summers back at the Equality Maine summer camp. And from personal experience, she's not only an amazing mentor, but an amazing leader. And we're so lucky to have her today. So please help me welcome you. Hey. Hello. How y'all doing? I'm going to come down here and pull the plug out. I'm not going to do that. Uh, is it okay if I sit? Yeah? Because it's a little weird for me to be standing up here, like, towering over you. I'm a little self-conscious of that. I'm not Godzilla in this lifetime. Maybe another lifetime. I'm going to come down here. Hi again. Hi. How y'all doing? <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Can everyone hear me okay? Even in the way back. Wave in the way back. Can you hear me? <laughs> Keep eating. That's fine. Just make sure you can hear me. Cool. Um, can you see the screen okay? I've never been in this room with the, 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 the curtains open, so this is like a brand new room. And I'm going to be distracted if a plane flies by or something. It's going to be a squirrel. Um, thank you, Blake. Thank you to the GSA for inviting me here to be here today. I think this is my sixth consecutive year to participate in Ally Week, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, before we get into today's talk, I do want to ask you a few questions, and you you can answer as honestly as you like. You can even lie if you really wanted to. I really wouldn't know, actually, because I don't know you. Um, let's start with a very simple question. Come on in, come on in, don't worry. Come on in. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt alone? Yeah. Raise your hand if you've ever felt alone. In my bedroom, yeah. Look around. Yeah. Most of you have felt alone once in your life. Great. Put your hands Me too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me ask you another question. How many of you have ever been harassed, called a name, or bullied in your entire life? Raise your hand if that's ever happened to you. Most of you. Look at that. All those hands. Sorry about that, but that's the reality for a lot of people in this world. Myself included. Myself included. Third question. There's a lot of questions because I want to really want to know what's going on in your lives before we dive into this conversation. Um, how many of you have seen someone be bullied, harassed, or called a bad name? Most of you have witnessed something. Most of you. Right. What number are we on? Three? One more is four? Thank you. All right. We're relying on you. Thank you. All right. Four. How many of you have witnessed Someone saying something bad to somebody, harassing somebody, bullying somebody, and you didn't do anything. All right, that's, that's a lot of hands. That's a lot of hands. So I think that's what we're going to be talking a little bit about today. It doesn't make you a bad person. Other things make you a bad person. We can talk about that later. But it's very human and very natural 
to sometimes be in a situation where you witness something happening and you wish you could say something. You wish you could jump in and be that superhero. But you don't. And there are many reasons why we don't do that. You know? And I get it, for sure. There are many things I've witnessed in my life and I wish I was stronger and more, more brave and more courageous. And I watch other people get hurt in the process. And that's, it's a bad feeling, but sometimes that's just where we are in our lives, for sure. For sure. Okay. So I, I was invited today to talk a little bit about what does it mean to be an ally. And that's just, it's an interesting term. Um, does anyone know what the word ally means? Does anyone know what the word ally means? Does anyone want to take a guess? Any of the students want to take a guess? Yeah, go ahead. So an advocate for somebody in the LGBTQ plus community. Is that what you said? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for speaking up. So an ally is an advocate for somebody. It doesn't have to be in the LGBTQ community. It could be an advocate for anybody in any community. Does anyone think of another name for ally? Partner. Partner, maybe. What else? Friend. Sure. A friend could be an ally too. Exactly. So there are many ways we can look at what it means to be an ally. Are you a friend? Are you an advocate? Are you a partner? That's all that means. We know that, that word ally gets thrown around a lot, but maybe people don't know what it really means to be an ally. So today we're going to talk a, a little bit about what it means to be an ally. But before we get to that, I, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, who I am and why I'm here uh, in the organization I work with that, that Blake mentioned earlier. Uh, <coughs> So like I said, I'm Gia, I use the pronoun she, her, and hers. I'm the program director for an organization called Equality Name. Um, I'm going to try to use this clicker to see if this works. Okay. <gasps> it did work. It's amazing when things work. We're going to talk a little bit about me, because why not? I'm here and I have the microphone. Uh, I'm going to hear a little bit about you. We're going to talk a little bit about Equality Name. I want to ask you a few questions, like I've already done, because that's the way I do things. I ask a lot of questions. Um, we may do some basics on LGBTQ terminology if, if you'd like. We don't have to. Um, I do want to practice some things with each other, so this will be interactive, so you can't just stay by yourself the entire time. Um, and then we're going to practice being an ally. I think that's a good thing, too. So that's my, that's my game plan for the next sort of hour or so. Are you ready? All right. Wearing a seatbelt? I don't think you need one, actually. I don't think this... That show is going to take off. But that would be really cool. Yeah, I'm a nerd now, so I like things like that. Um, so, Equality Maine is a nonprofit organization. So, I don't know if you even know what that is. We're not for profit. We're not to, out to make money. We're not out to whatever. We are out to provide education around what it means to be LGBTQ. We're out to build community to make sure LGBTQ people don't feel alone and that they're connected to one another. And three, we advocate for laws and policies that protect LGBTQ plus people. That's what Equality Maine does, and we've been doing that for 35 years. In fact, this is our 35th anniversary year. It's our 31st birthday as an organization. I've been doing this work with Equality Maine for about six years, and I'm gonna get to that in a second. But I do want to talk about how we started as an organization because I think it's so important and it relates to each and every one of you. And you didn't, you probably didn't know that. So, unless you've been in this talk before, you may have heard this story before. Who's been in this talk before? Anybody? One, two of you? Okay, so maybe you've heard some of these stories, so I apologize if this is redundant. Okay. So I want to tell you the story of Charlie Howard. So that's Charlie, right there on the screen. Um, I think at that point he was about 20 years old. Charlie grew up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Went to Portsmouth High School. Um, and then when he graduated from high school, he moved to Bangor, Maine. And Charlie was gay. And one night in July in 1984, Charlie and his friend were walking home one night after going to the movies or something. Walking down the street, just like some of you do on a weekend night or a weeknight with your friends. No big deal. Or it shouldn't have been a big deal. That night, 
a few teenagers were driving in a car. Like three of them, I think, if I remember the story correctly. And they were a little younger than Charlie and his friend. They were probably 16 and 17 years old. Is anyone 16 and 17 in here? A couple of you, great. You're really good at raising your hand, so that's, that's interesting. Um, so these three teenagers in this car started yelling from the window at Charlie and his friend. They started calling Charlie and his friend names. You can imagine what those kids were saying. And maybe you've heard that here in school or at home or when you walk down the street. Like fag, sissy, whatever. Words like that. Right? And they were yelling at Charlie and his friend, calling him names. Yeah, it was real. But then it got a little bit more intense. The kids pulled the car over and jumped out of their car. And they started to chase Charlie and his friend, continuing to call them names. That name calling turned into pushing and shoving. You've probably seen that happen. And then that pushing and shoving turned even more violent. One of the young kids picked up Charlie and dangled him over the edge of a bridge and said, I'm going to push you off this bridge. Charlie pleaded and said, please don't. I can't swim. The other kid didn't care and let him go. Charlie fell 30, 40 feet into the Gandusi stream and drowned. And died. So why did Charlie die? Yeah, he, he died because he drowned. But what drove those kids to kill Charlie? Um, they, Hold on a second. Go ahead. They just didn't care. They just wanted to do what they wanted and then they not listen to him. I can't hear you. You got to speak up. They didn't want to listen to him. They just didn't care. And did it anyways. Yeah, they didn't care. They didn't listen to him. Was it because he was gay? Who said yes? Maybe, right? I assume so too. I'm going to assume that they killed Charlie because he was gay. Imagine that. Ima imagine being killed for who you are. Just for who you are, something you can't control. Imagine being killed for the color of your skin. Right? Or the religion you believe in or because you're gay. That happens, and that happened here in Maine. It still happens all around the world, okay? And it, it was a horrible incident in 1984 when that happened. And what it did, and this happens too all across the world, that horrible tragedy where the young Charlie Howard right there was murdered because he was gay, people got upset. And that happens. When something bad happens, sometimes people get mad and say, wait a minute, this is not right. This shouldn't happen. So a group of young people, a group of teachers, a group of faith-based people got together in Bangor and said, you know what? We don't want this to happen again to another young person in our state. What can we do to make Bangor in Maine a safer place for LGBTQ plus people? And this included people who are LGBTQ, but also a bunch of allies who said, you know what, we need to do more as a community to keep this from happening ever again to a young person, specifically. And they formed a group, and they tried to find other people to gather. Some people wanted to join together, other people said, no, I don't want to be part of that LGBT stuff. Some churches closed their doors and said, no, you can't come in here, we don't want to have a vigil for Charlie. Some other churches said yes. And that group, which I think was called back in 1984, the main lesbian gay political alliance, formed to say, you know what? We can make Maine a better state. We can make Maine safer for everyone, especially LGBTQ people. We're gonna talk about what it means to be part of the community and celebrate it. We're gonna talk about how do we bring together people so people don't feel alone, because that's a real lousy feeling. And we're going to change laws and policies. So if people do things like that, they get in trouble. 
Because up until that place, up until 1984, there were no laws at all that protected LGBTQ plus people at all. Not one. There wasn't even a hate crime law. So even if they killed Charlie because he was gay, that really didn't matter. And because they were teenagers, as you know, you know the law pretty well, I hope, they served a little bit of time in juvenile justice and then were released when they turned 18. Their stories are pretty remarkable. And I've heard them. They've talked, actually, a few of them. Who've had to live with the fact that they killed another person. One of them is really, 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 really sorry. He got caught up in the moment. Peer pressure, a lot of inf lack, lack of information, a lot, a lot of stuff went on in his life, and he feels terrible about it. But imagine like living the rest of your life after doing something horrible. How do you make up for that? I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, Equality Maine is that organization. That little organization in Bangor that, that formed after the death of Charlie Howard, a young man, became Equality Maine. And so when I go out and talk to people all across the state and tell people what Equality Maine is, I usually talk about Charlie Howard. Because I want to make sure Charlie is in the room with us. His spirit his heart, all of it, you know? Because I also think, and this is sort of a side story, but it, it brings me here today, that same time in 1984, guess where I was? I was in high school. I was a senior in high school in 1984. And I had learned by the time I became a senior in high school that it was gonna be really hard to be bisexual and transgender. I knew from a very early age that I was a lot more like my sisters, and I knew by the time I went to middle school that I liked both boys and girls. And the few times I tried to be myself, I got teased and bullied and harassed. So by the time I became a senior in high school, I covered that up. And maybe you do this too. Maybe you put on that armor every morning when you leave the house. You put on this like facade to protect you from the world. I started like bulking up and exercising and I became a jock. <laughs> I'm still a jock. Um, I became a football player, track star. By the time I was senior, I was senior class president. I was captain of my high school football team. I was leader of my church organization. I was all that. And I was one of the most popular and strongest kids in school, but every day I went to school afraid. I was afraid my classmates would find out who I really was. And I remember this one day, it was senior year in high school. Any seniors in here? Hey, all right, way to go. You're almost there. It was Valentine's Day, senior year of high school. I don't know if you all do anything special at, here at South Portland. Do you do anything as a school? Candy winners. All right, perfect. Now, Valentine's Day is a weird holiday. If you're in love, it's great. If you just broke up with somebody, it sucks. <laughs> right? Totally get it. This Valentine's Day, someone sent me a carnation in my homeroom. Cute little pink carnation. Had a little note on it. No idea, because this has been like 36 years ago or something like that. Um, and I thought, oh, that's really pretty. I wonder if I could wear that today. So I took the pink carnation and I cut off the stem. And then I pinned it to my white button-down shirt, which I usually wore to school with my jeans and my Converse sneakers. And I thought, what the heck? What could go wrong? So I went to my first class, and no one really noticed. It was an art class, and I think art tends to be a little bit more cool about stuff. Went to another class, it was like math or something. I have no, no idea now. It's been a long time. But then I went to lunch. And our school was very much like South Portland, big, diverse high school outside of Boston, Massachusetts. We had about 2,400 students. 
And I remember walking into the cafeteria, and I'd actually walk down a set of stairs, and there were probably 600 people in the cafeteria getting their lunches or whatever. It was really noisy. And, and I saw some of my friends sitting over here where they always sit, and they were like my art friends, and over here were some of my jock friends over here, and over here were some of my pro dude friends that I partied with on the weekends. Yes, I had pro dude friends. Pro dude friends. I partied. So, sorry. I'm in trouble. <laughs> Anyways, and I didn't know who to sit with that day because I had this pink flower on my shirt. And I was wondering if anyone was going to notice. And guess what? They did. Especially this one kid. I think his name was Tony. And Tony didn't like the fact I was wearing a pink carnation. And he wanted to make sure everyone in the cafeteria, all 600 people, knew that. And so he called out pretty loudly, what the fuck do you think you're doing, you faggot? And a big like crowd sort of formed around Tony and me, as you may imagine. And then Tony like lunged at me, and he grabbed the flower from my chest, and ripped it off. Take that off, you sissy. As he ripped it off, he ripped my shirt, exposing my bare chest underneath, and my heart underneath that, which was exploding. So guess what I did? What would you do? What'd you say? Beat his ass. <laughs> yeah, you know, I did not run away. Um, I attacked him. Yes, absolutely. I, absolutely. I, I jumped on him and started wailing on him. And I'm not proud of this, but that's what I was taught. That's what I learned as a kid growing up with four older brothers. That if you get teased or picked on, you need to fight back. And before, and before I really hurt him, and I really probably could have hurt Tony because I was, you know, an asshole, and strong. Uh, we were separated by some teachers who were supervising in the cafeteria. Brave teachers to do that to separate two very upset students. Um, and we were sent to the principal's office because we were fine. Have you been there? I've been there a couple of times. This was fine. Yeah. I, I relate. So we were in the principal's office, and we're sitting there, and Tony is like, now laughing. He doesn't, he doesn't care. He's kind of laughing a little about it. I'm sitting there fuming, like angry, and blah, blah, blah. And the principal comes in and says, like, all right, what happened? Tony, what, what happened? Gina, what happened? That wasn't my name, but I'm going to use that. What happened? And we tell the story, and, and the principal asks Tony, you need to apologize. And Tony's like, all right, I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. All right, you need to accept. You're gonna accept Tony's apology, and I'm like, fuck no. And the principal's like, what? Aren't you gonna accept Tony's apology? And I'm like, no. And the principal's like, why not? It's just a flower. And they couldn't tell the principal what that flower really meant to me. You know. That that flower really was who I really was on the inside, that girl. So I got suspended. My mom came to pick me up. I remember we were driving home. Uh, my mom drives like this now, she's 90. Um, she probably shouldn't be driving. Um, and then she kind of looks over at me and says, hey, what are we going to tell your dad? Because this keeps happening. And I'm like, I don't know. And I couldn't tell my mom either. I couldn't tell my mom why I was so angry and what that flower really meant to me. And I hate that feeling. I really, really, when I think back now, like how many years it's been, 30 some years, I really hate that feeling that I didn't trust my mother. To like say, hey mom, that flower meant something really special to me. That flower really was a symbol of the girl I am inside. 
So I didn't trust her, so I didn't tell her. But I feel lousy to this day that I didn't tell her that 35 years ago. You know? And so I said, I don't know, I'm just angry about something, I don't know. And I didn't talk to my mom about it for another 25 years. And I kept a lot about that story and about me being bisexual and trans hidden from the world for about 25 more years. And that was really hard. You know, I was just afraid about being myself. Because the few times I tried to be myself, I got bullied and harassed and beat up. And I said, you know what? Maybe it's not worth it. Maybe I can just be myself in private and go out and do other things and whatever and find some joy in another way. So when I think about the work I do at Equality Maine, I think about Charlie, there's Charlie, who was murdered in 1984 because he was gay. And I think about me, that I'm still here. I don't feel guilty about it. But I want to make sure that I can do whatever possible in my life to make sure not one more young person feels alone, gets bullied and harassed, or is killed for who they are. That's my mission. That's what I care about mostly in my life. I'm okay. I've made it. Right? Here I am talking to all of you. Right? I'm doing okay. So I'm looking out for the other Charlies out there. Making sure that doesn't happen again. So that's why I do this work, for sure. And that's what we do at Equality Maine. We make sure people don't feel alone. They then they feel great about who they are from the time they're born to the time they die. That's what Equality Maine does. And we don't do it alone. We need allies. We need allies to speak up, to step up, and stand by our sides. Right? That's what being an ally is, for sure. All right. So I'm going to move forward a little bit. Maybe. Maybe. Yay! Here we go. Some pictures. All right. Um, like I said, I'm the program director at Equality Maine. I was a high school teacher. What? I was a high school teacher for 20 years. Um, I taught art and photography for the most part. And I was a track and field coach and a football coach. How about that? Um, when I transitioned, you know what that means, right? You're a smart group, right? I transitioned on the job about 10 years ago, nine years ago. And over a matter of months, in a, in a town not far from here, I went from Mr. Drew to Mr. Drew in the classroom. And where I was a track and field coach, I went from Coach Drew to Coach Drew. Hey, 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 I got a laugh today. That's good. Thank you very much. Um, and when I did that, I became one of the first out trans public school teachers in Maine. And I became one of the first out transgender high school coaches in the country. It's kind of bananas. It's kind of cool. Like, wow. That was terrifying. I really wish I wasn't first. That's a time when I'm like, I don't want to be first. Why weren't there hundreds of people before me? What happened? Why weren't there other people out before me as trans teachers? What is so wrong with being trans? Nothing, exactly, thank you, nothing at all. But apparently there was, because people hadn't come out before. And when I came out as a teacher, it was terrifying. My colleagues didn't know what to do. Some of them were nice, some of them became really distant. Some of the parents of the kids I was teaching were terrified and pulled the kids out of my classroom. They took their kids off my track and field team. Students, they were great. Thanks for being great. You know, they're all like, all right, Miss Drew, do we have homework? <laughs> That's all they care about. All right, you're Miss Drew now, well, big deal. You know, and that was kind of refreshing, like, all right, very cool, very cool. So that's cool. Uh, I live in Katie Bunkport, where I love to hang out. I like to swim in the ocean, I feel like I'm a mermaid. Um, I'm a marathon runner, a triathlete. I love to cook, I love to read. And uh, that's me, up there, in kindergarten, with a little stupid smile. 
1972. That's me before my last triathlon. That's me and my, my beautiful parents who love me unconditionally. And that's me and my partner. Happy as bees and carrots. Do those go together? Maybe? Yeah, all right, cool. All right, let me ask you a couple questions just to get a feel. How many of you have a close personal friend, family member, who is gay, lesbian, bisexual, or pansexual, whomever? Look at that, okay. most of you in this room, look around with all the beautiful hands. Great, great, most of you have close personal friend, family member is LGB or P. All right, very cool. How many of you have a close personal friend, family member who is trans, gender non-conforming, non-binary? Many of you, but not as many as before. All right, so there's a little difference there, which is natural, I think, at this point. It's still pretty hard to be out as trans in this world. And maybe there are just less trans people than LGBT people in the world, too. So. But most of you know someone in those categories, which is kind of... When I grew up, I didn't know one person who was trans in my entire life. I didn't meet my first trans person, like knowingly meet someone who was trans, until I was 43 years old. I felt alone until I was 43 years old, because I'd never met another trans person in my entire life. That sucked. So I'm glad you have people in your life. And if you're not part of the community, maybe you're an ally. Or maybe you'd like to be an ally, but you don't know how to do it. We're going to talk about that. Before we go any further, before I keep talking, are there any questions you have about what I've said so far? Because I don't want to wait till the end for some questions, because sometimes we don't have time. Has anything come up yet that you have a question about? Yes? Uh, are you transgender? My name is, yeah, my name is Gia, and I think I already said that I'm transgender. Yes. Oh. Yeah, cool. But, you bring up a good point. What's your name? Jackson. Jackson brings up a really good point. Jackson was about to say something about my voice. What were you going to say? Uh, I was about to say something about your voice, maybe. I heard you were about to say something about my voice. That your voice, that your voice sounds deep. It is deep. Thank you very much. Just because my voice is deep doesn't make me transgender. That just means I have a deep voice. Right? Does that make sense to everybody? Just because someone has a high voice doesn't make them transgender either. Does that make sense? I think that sounds like a math problem, but I have to do the, the, the math equation on that, right? So your voice, tone of voice, doesn't have anything to do with whether you're trans or not, for sure. Because there, there are women with high voices, and there are women with low voices. And there are men with high voices, and there are men with low voices. And then there are non-binary people with high voices, and there are non-binary people with low voices. And medium voices. That's for sure. But, since Jackson brought it up, I do get misgendered a lot. Do you know what that means, misgendered? Yeah, a little bit? When someone thinks I'm a different gender than I am. Usually that's not like, hey, how's it going? It's usually it's on the phone because of my voice. Like when I call LLB, I'm like, where are my boots? They're like, sorry, sir, they're, they're back ordered. They'll be in in another month. I'm like, well, it's ma'am, and it's already snowing. So I have to correct people sometimes. It gets a little tiring, but they get it. Yeah, new question. That's a great question. What's your name? Eric. Eric's brilliant. Uh, really? Thanks for asking that question. That's probably like, you're going to get more credit on anything if you ask questions. If you just sit in the back and don't ask any questions, you're going to like fail everything. That's for sure. If you, if you sit up front and you ask questions, teachers are going to notice and you're going to do better. I'm not calling you out in the back today because I don't know you. But next time, for sure. Um, non-binary. As far as I know what non-binary is, because I'm not non-binary, I, I understand non-binary. Um, do you know what the word binary means? Do you know what that means? No? Do you know what that means? No. Does anyone know what the word binary means? Uh, no? Does anyone know what the word binary Yeah. You don't conform to a gender. You're like, oh, well, that's, 
Yeah, but the, just the word binary itself, oh. just general. Where are the back? Uh, you probably conform. You have to, to yell. A, you probably conform to a gender. Okay. Uh, yes, but how about just the word binary? Yes, this fits. Thank you. Binary, just in general terms, means two. You have two choices, right? Yes, no, black, white, left, right, up, down, one, zero. Binary only means two. You have two choices. That's all binary means. The expression of non-binary in terms of gender, like you said in the back, is someone who says, you know, this system around gender, as if there's only two, is a little messed up. That actually isn't true, right? The idea that gender is either or, I don't believe that. And myself, or someone who's non-binary, may say, you know what? I'm neither a boy or a girl. I'm non-binary. Maybe I'm a little of both, but I'm not one or the other. So non-binary, Eric, means I don't fit into one of those little categories. How does that sound? Good. Yeah. What do you mean? Nice. It's a good choice. My barbecue chips there. All right. Other question before we go ahead. How would I? So I deal a lot with people who are transphobic. Do you know what the word transphobic means? You do? You're nodding your head. Can you tell me? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Why would you like someone who's transgender? Right? Well, transphobic means people who are afraid. A phobic means you have a fear, right? It's actually a psychological term. To have a phobia of trans people means you're afraid of being around trans people. Right? And I know what it feels like. I've walked in to, when I first started transitioning, I remember walking into the Target over in South, over in South Park, over there. Um, and a mom saw me and she took her kids and like, we're going this way kids, away from me. Right? I remember walking into a locker room at my gym in Kenny Bob, and the women were like, oh, and kind of walked away. Right? I think they were afraid of me. So they had some type of transphobia that I was going to do something that was going to hurt them or their kids. And I understand it. I totally understand it. And maybe you don't get this, or maybe you do. I was taught from a very early age that being trans was dangerous. I was born in 1967, a very long time ago. And up until very recently, there were no positive depictions of transgender people anywhere. If I was in a, if, if was a trans character in a movie, I was a villain. I was a serial killer, I was a rapist, I was the worst type of person. If I was a character in a book or a novel or a comic, I was horrible. And I believed that. As a kid growing up, I believed being trans was dangerous and I should be feared. Because that's all I heard and saw in the world. And so I started to believe it. I had my own transphobia. I was afraid of myself. It's called internalized transphobia. And so before I could deal with other people hating me, I had to figure out how to like look at myself in the mirror and love myself for who I was. And that was really hard. So when you ask me how do I deal with transphobia out in the world, I first had to deal with it for myself. I had to look at myself, I had to connect with other trans people and find out what was beautiful in myself besides my appearance. Because I, if I just saw my appearance, I hated it. And if I thought about all the depictions of myself out in the, in the world as trans people, I was like, oh, that's disgusting. So I had to find other things to find beauty in. And then I had to learn about other trans people and what, what it really means to be trans and learn about their stories. So when I run into people who are transphobic, I understand where they're coming from because they've been taught to be transphobic. They weren't born transphobic. They were taught to be transphobic. 
so I understand. I want to hear them. I want to hear what's going on. Why are you afraid of trans people? Right? And so I listen to them. I mean, hear what they have to say. And then if they say something that I think is incorrect, I'll say, you know what? I understand where you're coming from, but I don't think that's correct. You know what? And I've talked to and listened to thousands of transgender people. And I don't think we're the problem. But I understand where you're coming from with your fear. And I get it. So that's what I do with people who are transphobic. I want to hear what, where it's coming from. Is it authentic? Is it coming from a place of fear? Or are they just repeating something they heard from their parents? And maybe they aren't really truly transphobic, but they're just hearing something that their friend said or their parents said. And that sometimes is the case. Does that make sense? What was your name? Amelia, thank you, great question. Any, any more questions before we move forward? Those are great questions. Give yourself extra points. Teachers, if you're in the room right now and your students are asking questions, pay attention. Because if I were your teacher, excellent. All right, moving on. Uh, we're not going to do this. This is. Are you? Do you want to do a game? Sure? Are you brave? Yes. Or are you chicken? Brave. I don't know, I think you're chicken. Are you really brave? Yeah. Are you are you sure? Yes. I'm not gonna do it if people don't participate, because this is gonna take some like real courage. You got some courage? Yeah. Really? How about the kids in the back? You got courage back there? No, like, no, no, no! I don't blame you, I don't blame you, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Alright, we're gonna, we're gonna do something, but you have to... For those who want to participate, you actually have to fully participate, right? You got it? Alright, this is, this is what it means to be an ally. This is what this conversation is about. So if you want, want to be an ally, you need to participate. If you want to sit and not participate, that's fine. I'm not going to pick on you now. When you leave, I'm going to make fun of you, but not to your face. Oh, I said that out loud. I'm sorry. All right. So we're going to, we're going to do a, an interactive thing. And for those of you who really want to be allies, this is good practice because it's self-reflection. All right? And if you don't want to do it, I will make fun of you. Your teachers will notice them. So there you go. So we're going to do this. We're going to put the rules up on the board. I want you to think about this question. When did you realize you are the gender that you are? Just think about it. Think about it. If you have a gender. When did you realize you're not binary? When did you realize you're a boy? When did you realize you're a girl? When did you realize you're a little of a Maybe you're still figuring it out. That's cool. Maybe it was Tuesday. I don't know. Think about how you understand gender for yourself personally. Just like, all right, hmm, I, for me, I'm gonna do me right now. I am a woman. Um, I've always thought of myself as a girl or a woman in my entire life, though I pretended to be something else. I've always known inside that I was a girl or a woman. That hasn't ever gone away. Um, now I want you to think about how has that at all impacted the way you behave? The way you dress? The way you cut or color your hair? The way or whether you wear any makeup? Or jewelry? Or the way you talk? The way you gesture, the roles you perform for your family, for your friends. How does that relate to you, to your gender at all? All right, you got that so far? Pretty good? All right, this chord is not long enough for this next part. So I'm going to drop this chord down for a second, see if I can find a, a space. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. All right, good. Yeah. So I want you to think of this word. It's 
not a word I love, it's not a word I hate, it's just a word. I'm going to go over here. How's it going back here? Good. All right. Um, do you know the word feminine? Yeah. yeah. Think about it for a second. Think about what it means to you. What does it mean to be feminine? You don't have to answer that. Think about it. All right? So we're going to put the word feminine, if I were to write it on this wall, if I had like a Sharpie, I'd do it, but I'm not going to do it because I'd get in trouble if this so this you would never invite me back. So let's put the word feminine right here, okay? And then I'm going to put a fake piece of tape on the floor here, and it's going to go around the room. Just like this. And then it's going to turn by to Jackson, right? Good. All the way this way. And now I'm in the middle. And now I'm going to go over here and turn off this staircase. And what's the word over here, do you think? Masculine. You're brilliant. <laughs> so smart. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put the word masculine over here. Think about what that word means to you. Right? You know what it means? All right. Now, here comes the hard part. Because being an ally is hard. I want you to think about where you would put yourself on that line. Where would you put yourself on that line? Based on your own understanding of your own gender, right here and now at 1041 on this beautiful Thursday morning in South Portland. Knowing that that may change 10 minutes from now, tonight, this weekend when you're on a date, or if you're ice fishing, don't go ice fishing. Ice is not thick enough yet. Where would you put yourself on this line? From the most feminine over here to the most masculine over there and everywhere in between. Where would you put yourself right now today? Think about it. No. Now, once you figure out where you're going to go, here are some instructions. I think they're on the board. I want you to go to that spot quietly. Not too quiet. Go to that spot where you think you should go. Come on. I love your enthusiasm. When you get there, make sure there, there's not a clump. So there's no ties. So if there's like a clump of people, just spread out a little. That's fine. Okay? Then when you get into that space, I want you to turn to the people to your left and to your right and ask a few questions. Hey, why are you here? Well, why are you here? Well, I'm here because this is what I think about my gender and masculine and feminine and blah, blah, blah. So I want you to talk to the people to your right and to your left and ask those questions and hear what they have to say. Now, one more rule. No, two more rules. I like rules. I hate rules. I like rules. I don't know anymore. <laughs> uh, there are no ties. You decide where you go. There's no pushing. Looking at you. <coughs> I heard right. Uh, anything else? All right, I think that's it. How much time do you need to do that? Uh, four minutes? All right. What's the word over there? Over there? Go do it.
that we're standing with over here, um, it, we still um, identify as like female, and we still like, carry some feminine traits. But a lot of our attributes that we have, that like, when we're most comfortable, are associated with like masculinity rather than being feminine. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak up about what you talked about when you got to your place on the line? Or feelings you had about actually getting out of your seat and getting into a line? I just want to... Oh, hold on a second. Go ahead. Um, what do you know? um, when we were first talking about where you would put yourself on the line, I was a little bit worried because I'm gender fluid, so it changes a lot. And I was like, am I going to be like running from side to side? <laughs> But, and like I don't always quite know, so I kind of put myself here because at this very moment I'm feeling a little bit more masculine than feminine, and I guess it's cool to think about like, in this moment, what am, what am I? <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, that's great. Really appreciate that. How about back here? We haven't heard from this side of the room yet. Any of you want to speak up about why you're where you are and how, what you talked about? Um, Go for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, what do you notice? This is just really superficial social science, because I'm very superficial. Um, look around the room for a second. What do you notice about where people are? Is there anything you want you notice? Just a really superficial observation about where most people are? You want to add something? All right, so we, I noticed hair. So it looks like maybe shorter hair is over here, longer hair is over there, okay? For the most part, but this is superficial, just general glances, thank you. Other observations of what you see without, without calling out and being shameful, but go ahead. Um, it just seems like on the outside, they're more like concrete in one area. There is less, there's more females spread out mm -hmm. rather than like males spread out. All right, so I think the observation is some of the, the folks over here are more clumped at this corner versus this side seems to be a little bit more spread out. All right, great, great observation. Other observations without, like, judgment, just observation. Yeah, I'm not judging, but it just seems that people on this side are wearing the more stereotypical masculine clothing and people on this side are wearing more skirts, dresses, kind of clothing, you know, like feminine stuff. And awesome. All right, hello. No, just an observation just on how people are dressed. Maybe there's a, a look, right? I think that's something we can look at and say, I wonder, is a, a hoodie and a baseball cap like masculine? I don't know. I don't, I don't have any answers at all, but I think that's an interesting thing to, to notice. Right, thank you for pointing that out, for sure. Other observations you have without judgment, because these are really interesting. There's not as many folks in the middle today here. Yeah, I'm just looking. Most of the group is either over here or over here, which is really interesting. I just did this yesterday for the town of Kennebunk, for like all the police officers, all the firefighters, all the public works, all the town officials. It was a really interesting mix. It was actually more evenly spread out throughout the whole room. There was definitely a clump and a clump, but there was more here. So sometimes it, it varies depending on the group of people. Any other observations before we move on? You got one more? You think so? Okay. I wonder about that. That's a really interesting observation. They were saying something about people are really sure of themselves, or they Seem like people are sure of themselves. Yes. I think it's, uh, for me at least, really hard to pick a place to be on the spectrum that you set up because at any given moment I could be at a different place. If I'm playing heavy metal guitar, I'd be on that far end. Uh, if I am out shopping, I'll probably be on that far All right. end. And you said this given moment, so this is where I ended up. But really, it's kind of arbitrary. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think that 
the idea of a static position along this spectrum is not a reality for anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. All right, back to your seats. Thank you. yourself and exposing yourself to other people's like observation potential criticism right can you take your feet down please yeah, yeah you thank you I, I know you're comfy but please don't you're not the only one but just come on I do that at home but you know, not when I'm working um, someone just asked me where would I put myself and I put myself over there for a good chunk of my life, I was over there. When I first transitioned, I was way over there. Today, I'll put myself probably over there. I don't know, it changes. Like people said, sometimes it changes. But I also want you to think about this question. Do you think people 